the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. That's from Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. When I was growing up in North Texas and Lois in Colorado, I could never have imagined how God would take our family to live in a remote mountain village on the Thailand Lao border. Here, I will explain that journey. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God tells us, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God knows my past and yours, every sordid detail of it. He also knows our future, but I'm glad I don't. If I'd known back then what he had in store for us, I'd have been scared. For the past 70 years, the Mien people have been a vital part of my life. So this is a summary of our family and of our introduction to this fascinating people group. I'm doing this video in the year 2020 with deep gratitude to my Lord for bringing me safely through the past hundred years of my life. Here we were talking with men Christians in the 1980s at a reception for the Thai king's mother. Lord, all we have accomplished is really from you, Isaiah 26, 12. Anything, everything worthwhile that we may have done has really been through his mercy and his grace. Thank you, Lord. My daddy became a successful businessman and a civic leader. He also was addicted to his cigars. When his doctor told him he would have to quit smoking, Daddy said, then I'll find a new doctor, and he did. The Callaways have always had a stubborn streak ever since. Late in life, Daddy did quit smoking and did come back to church. My mama was a bank bookkeeper before their marriage. She kept those books in order and kept us kids in line too. For many years, she was Sunday school superintendent at our church, and she made sure that all seven kids were there too. My daddy went by Charlie, so I was called C.W. or Dub. I was just a small town boy from the North Texas Plains. In 1920, taxes were few. There was no national debt, and Mom stayed home to raise the kids. Those were the good old days. If it had been possible, I would have cried, Get this dress off of me. But baby boys as well as girls were put in dresses in those days. A picture of Mama, Leela, and me, and four of our brothers. Six boys, and each one has a sister, my daddy would often say. But we six boys had to share that sister. We took a road trip to Royal Gorge, Colorado. Look, kids, away down there, Mama would often say. And but then she would quickly add, But Daddy, don't you look, since he was driving on that scary road. Buried with Christ and raised with him too. When I was 11, I made the decision to give my heart to Jesus and was baptized. In the picture, a young boy is baptized at youth camp. In 1932, we moved south 47 miles to Canadian, Texas. So through my teenage years, I was a Canadian. Our town was also on the Canadian River. I did finish high school as valedictorian, but that was only because my class was small and I studied hard. 
The Great Depression was from 1929 to early 1940s. Unemployed men hitched free rides on freight trains in search of work. A gallon of gas cost 23 cents. I remember when hamburgers cost a dime. I remember the horrible Dust Bowl years. The worst was Black Sunday, April the 14th, 1935. Lois was born in a simple sod house similar to this one in Adena, Colorado in 1921. Then her teenage years were in Fort Morgan, Colorado. Here we see Fort Morgan and Adena in the center of this map of the northeast corner of Colorado. Lois was being weighed on these scales. She was found to be worthy. Lois and her brother Keith, he was on their grandpa's forward. She was growing taller. The family still lived in Adena, Colorado. Lois as a high school graduate. Her father was British. He never became an American citizen nor a Christian. Her mother sought her getting the kids to church. Yes, Lord, I will serve you on a foreign field, Lois had pledged. She had planned a career in journalism, but in high school answered God's call to missions. I entered Phillips University Bible College in 1938. Lois arrived a year later. In high school, I had made a commitment to Christian service and entered the Bible College in Enid, Oklahoma to prepare for ministry. On the left, you see Periton and Canadian, Texas. 160 miles east of Canadian is Enid, Oklahoma, our college town. For one year, I hitchhiked weekends to preach in Cash, 160 miles south. I was preaching in Glencoe when Lois and I were married. While preaching in Cash, Oklahoma, I was the cashless preacher. There, my weekly salary was $5. But when I became pastor in Glencoe, my salary was doubled to $10. When Lois and I married, it was raised to $11. We had to do a lot of penny pinching, but so did most people since World War II was going on. Most churches had services twice each Sunday, so I preached twice each weekend for about five years. In college, God used a missions class and the weekly student volunteers meetings to draw me into a commitment of my life to foreign missions. Lois and I took turns being president and vice president of the club. On February the 14th, 1940, I wrote this note on a scrap of paper. May I forget, O Lord, that I am anything. Let me lose myself in your service, I said to the Lord. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. Because of that uh, commitment, we began dating. She chased me for two years until I caught her. And then I got to marry her on May the 28th, 1942. Our wedding cost me $14, $2 for the license, $7 for her ring, and $5 for the preacher. But we were still in love when she died 54 years later. She was the most patient woman who put up with me all those years. I was glad my folks liked Lois too. Daddy wrote about her. It looked like Dub knew a good thing when he saw it. Almost a year later, God blessed us with our first child, Leland. This was our only vehicle, but we managed.
In August 1943, when Leland was three months old, we traveled by bus to visit our parents in Texas, Colorado, and then by train to Cincinnati, Ohio. There we studied weekdays at Cincinnati Bible Seminary. I got a part-time job at a big department store for several months. And then, early in 1944, I became student pastor at Syria and Bethel Christian Churches near Orleans, Indiana. This map shows the route we took to Cincinnati and the 150-mile route we took in a fellow student's car each weekend back west to southern Indiana. As a student pastor in Indiana, I was receiving the generous salary of $20 per week. With that, we managed to save back $50 or so and to buy a second-hand Model A Ford car. It was similar to this one, but nothing like this fancy. Leland was here in Indiana in 1944. Those eyes told us mischief coming. World War II was September the 1st, 1939 to September the 2nd, 1945. It had been going on through most of my college years. I had two brothers and a brother-in-law in the Navy. One brother was a Navy pilot. One was in the Army. I was exempted from the draft since I was a student preacher. Preachers were considered worthwhile in those days. What a great and happy day it was for our country when the newspapers screamed, The War Ends! In the spring of 1946, we closed our ministry in Indiana and drove our old Model A Ford from Indiana to Fort Morgan, Colorado. Late in December 1946, we sailed past the Statue of Liberty from New York. Our voyage to England took eight days. We faced strong winds and huge waves. Lewis and I got very seasick, but unfortunately, our sons kept running circles around us. I took a glorified first aid course at the Missionary School of Medicine in London, England. We both also got an introduction to the Burmese language there. We toured London on the Underground, which was the British name for their subway. We had tried for many months to get a visa to Burma. Then the day the Burmese Embassy opened in London after they gained independence, we got visa number one. Thank you, Lord. We sailed to Rangoon, Burma on the SS Burma, a freighter. From Liverpool, we passed the Rock of Gibraltar and unloaded cargo at Port Said in Egypt, Sudan, Yemen, and Colombo in Sri Lanka. We sailed over biblical seas, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. God had opened a wide path in the Red Sea for the Israelites to escape from Egypt, but that gap had been closed for 3,000 years, so we had no trouble sailing right over it. That was one long voyage. February the 11th, we left Liverpool, and on April the 6th, we docked in Rangoon, Burma. That was a total of 55 days for the trip. Not only had there been those long stops to unload and take on cargo, but the ship propeller broke, and it took three weeks in Colombo to repair it. The Holy Spirit kept Paul from going into certain areas, and a hostile government kept us from our original goal. After four months of fruitless effort to gain permission to serve in northern Burma, we had to move on to China. Lewis, with Leland and Mark, flew from Rangoon, now called Yangon, 
to Kunming on August the 10th, 1948. I went later in a truck convoy to Pigou, then by train to Mandalay, and then onward by one truck to the China border and by another to Kunming. I later wrote my own 16-day trip from Burma to China was one of the most memorable and hazardous trips of my lifetime. Here is the road down to the Mekong River. It is part of the Burma road which I traveled to Kunming, China. This was a main Kunming street in 1948 with Chinese shoppers, rickshaws, and even a jeep. We served with uh, this team of missionaries in China. I was in the middle of the back row, and Lois was third from right in the second row, and our two sons were in front. Later, several of these also served in Thailand. The top part of the Chinese character is Lam, and the bottom part is me, and the two together make righteousness. The meaning is, only with the Lamb of God over me do I have righteousness. We love the Chinese language and the Chinese people, but we, like most missionaries, left just before the communists completed their takeover in 1949. We evacuated to Hong Kong in September. Our senior missionary, Russell Morris, who stayed on, was put in prison for a year by the communists. The best thing we got out of China was a daughter by the name of Joyce. She was two months old when we left China. I was named Galloway and Lois was Galloway. Our surname, Gal, means tall. We were in Hong Kong 22 days and then we sailed on the SS Hoi Wong for 20 days to Thailand. In Hong Kong, Imogene Williams chose to join us in a new venture for Christ. Our ship docked in Bangkok on October the 18th, 1949. In Bangkok, we began our study of the Thai language with Kru Tat, who is shown here with Lewis and Imogene. On May the 5th, 1950, His Majesty Pumipon Adunyadate was crowned as Thailand's new king. We didn't get to see this crowning ceremony, but I did see him in the coronation procession. He was dressed in ancient, beautiful, royal garments, was seated on a golden throne under the royal umbrella, and was carried on the shoulders of Thai attendants dressed in picturesque attire. Three decades later, we did speak a few words with him. In a Bangkok bookshop, I found a charming little book called The Land of Smiles. It was by W.A.R. Wood, who for many years had been the British consul in Chiang Mai. This book introduced me to a number of the mountain tribes and to a quaint little town called Ching Kham. So around February the 20th, I set out on a two-week trip to Ching Kham and other cities in northern Thailand. The most pleasant surprise which I had was in discovering that there were many tribal people in northern Thailand who understood Chinese. The Mien Shaman, as in this picture, often used Chinese in their spirit worship. I was able to converse with Mien and Hmong and other tribesmen in Yunnanese. Thus, the time we had spent in Yunnan learning Chinese was of much value in reaching them for Christ. The Lord still works all things together for good, even as is promised. After six months in Bangkok, we all traveled north by train, trucks, and then ox carts. En route, we celebrated Leland's seventh birthday. On May the 11th, three ox carts, in front of which walked the three missionaries, 
and two little American boys lumbered slowly into Chingkam. What a strange sight that must have been to the unsuspecting locals. With the help of a local Indian merchant who could speak English, we were able to rent and move to this two-story wooden house. After our mission nurse Dorothy Ulig arrived, then she and Imogene lived here and opened the Chingkam Christian Clinic. Our family moved on to another house. We were blessed to meet a Chinese Christian merchant, Jin Yong Sen, whose wife was a man. In late 1950, he and I visited the most prominent men village of that area, Pulanga. We stayed in the huge home of the Jiaopaya, which means big chieftain. We slept on the wooden guest shelf along with one or more opium smokers and other guests. We were able to share with a number of men and Chinese the basic good news of our Creator and of the way of salvation through His Son Jesus. I had high hopes of Jin Yong Sen developing into an evangelistic associate among the men, but sadly he died in early 1951. He had had a brief respiratory illness and gave himself an injection which may have led to his death. Many of his Chinese friends assisted with his funeral arrangements and burial procession. I led in a Christian memorial service and he was buried in the Ban Wiyong Christian Cemetery. Our first converts were his men wife Fei On and his 12-year-old Chinese nephew. She was probably the first convert among men in Thailand. After his death, she helped us in our initial study of the men. Fifty years later, I wrote this book to help men youth to learn to read their language. Lois and I had written numerous other books in men. Aon was related to the headman of this village where we later lived among the men. She had suggested that we might settle there in what we later came to refer to as San Puville. Years later, she led her aunt to the Lord, and here I was baptizing that aunt in a stream south of Chingkam. Feon is at left foreground wearing the white dress in the picture. In 1950 and 1951, we were doing all we could to prepare ourselves for life in a men village. But we were also waiting for the arrival of our fourth child. Jenny was born in June 1951. About uh, three months later, we left our three older kids in the good care of Dorothy and Imogene, but Lois was nursing Jenny. So Jenny was here in the basket at the far end of this Thai porter's pole. Here we were starting out on a foot journey for a 10-day trip to explore the possibilities of moving into Tan Fuville or some other men village. On that trip, Lois is holding our three-month-old daughter Jenny in a Hmong village. The basket in which Jenny was carried at one end of a bamboo pole on the shoulder of a Thai porter is at Lois's feet. For seven months, we lived in this crudely built, dirt-floored bamboo shack. By the end of the rainy season, the grass roof was a disaster. We needed a break, and Lois was pregnant with our fifth child, so we moved back down to Chingkam. Our four older kids were admiring their new baby brother, David. We'd been away from our homeland for seven years, so mid-1953, we returned to America for a year. That gave opportunity to have some good times with our parents and siblings are shown here. We also attended the Summer Institute of Linguistics and visited our supporting churches. 
Leland and Mark got to attend public school for a change. When we returned to Thailand in 1954, we had a nice team of co-workers in Chingkam. Our family is in the middle of this picture with two Byers families, the Garland Bear family and Dorothy and Imogene. They supported us spiritually and materially. When we lived in the mountains, they arranged for Thai porters to take mail and supplies to us once or twice a month. On occasions when we were in Ching Kong, we cooperated with our co-workers. Here, our bicycles were riding us across a stream en route to help out at the leprosy village of Sopwe. In 1955, we moved back to San Fuville near the Lao border in a new house I had designed and helped to build. That house was two stories high for a reason. We homeschooled our kids for several years so a large private room upstairs was reserved for them to do their homework. The house had woven bamboo walls for many months until we had enough money to get wooden boards sawn. One day our boy's friend, Inquisitive, as we called him, climbed up the bamboo matting to talk with them. I told him that was a no-no until they had a break time. Lois was called Mother Teacher, and this book was based on her memoirs. One chapter in it is called Bear Attack. While men were hunting deer, a bear struck down a young men man and tore open his face. It would have taken many days to carry him to a hospital, so we with very limited medical knowledge had the miserable task of caring for him. Hi-ho, Silver! Usually on family trips, it was the younger children who got to ride one of our two horses or the mule. Those animals came in handy, especially for hauling supplies. Away over in Massalong, fellow missionaries had led Gui Ching to the Lord. After breaking the opium habit, he passionately witnessed to God's saving grace. He, along with a few other converts, recorded testimonies that were put on records. We played those records often in our area and later distributed hand-operated photographs and records widely. About uh, 1958, Gui Ching, with several of his family and two missionary ladies, visited our village. They shared their testimonies boldly, but none in our village responded. We and our kids often played the gospel photograph records for groups of men, as here in this picture. I traveled frequently to other villages to witness there. But in the six or so years we lived there, only four Chinese and three elderly men women came to know Christ as Savior and Lord. Much later, we learned that the former headman had threatened to kill any who became Christian. Leland, our entrepreneur, made money by raising goats. For several years, we also homeschooled our children, but in their free time, they played and served among the neighbor kids. Leland made this goat cart, which his siblings enjoyed riding in. Leland and Mark, along with Ty Porters, built a small bamboo cabin in their own hidden valley. We had some men to build this wooden slide next to our house. The neighbor kids, along with ours, enjoyed it. Joyce was small, but she was determined to cut down that tree. Sir Monkey, from his perch, was dressing Jenny's hair. Finally, as all of our kids were getting up to school age, homeschooling was getting too much for us. 
So we had to start sending two first, and finally all of them away to school. Here in Chiang Mai, Joyce in the center and Mark at the right, were in the school play of Rip Van Winkle. Communists were struggling to take over as much of Southeast Asia as they could. They had forced us to leave China, and now they were on our doorstep once again. So we had to abandon our cabin in the clouds in 1961 and return to Chiang Kham. There, we eventually built this home and with our fellow missionaries built and supervised dormitories for Mien and Hmong students. Over many years, we witnessed to many Mien villages. Finally, a small church was established in Ban Mai Romian. This was their first building in late 1960s. It had bamboo poles and a thatched roof, but that was about all. The few men Christians had built it themselves. A more substantial building was built in the 1970s. And the current building was completed and dedicated in 2006. From 1975 onwards, many thousand men, along with Hmong, Kamu, Lahu, Lao, fled the communist takeover of Laos and were confined in several refugee camps in Thailand. This is an aerial view of the Ching Kham camp, which was the main camp in which we served. Life was rough in those camps. But after all they had endured in Laos and an uncertain future, they were much more open to the gospel than most in Thailand. What a joy it was to see 150 men baptized one day and to worship with them in their church in the camp. Here are some of the Christians and their children in that camp. They later were scattered in France, Canada, and USA. Not one of them was eaten by the white cannibals they had been told lived in the West. Instead, they are now living vastly different lives. My heart overflows with praise as I reflect on what God has done and is doing now among my men, brothers and sisters in Christ. A few men became Christians in Vietnam in 1938. There may now be as many as 30,000 men Christians among a world total of perhaps as many as 2 million. This is certainly not as a result of the work of our family alone. Around 30 missionaries have focused their work on the men. Hundreds of men Christians have witnessed to others. Thousands of prayer warriors have labored on their knees. Hundreds of churches have been established in Asian countries. As the psalmist proclaimed, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Here, each person is holding high a copy of the Bible during the dedicatory prayer in Richmond, California on June the 7th, 2008. This was just one of many joyous events held in celebration of the completion of this Men Bible. Another of the celebrations for the Bible was at Men Family Camp in California in August 2008. Seventy years ago, shortly before we left China, we attended a Christian musical. A large choir of Chinese Christians, along with Westerners from various countries, faced a dreadful future, but they sang with such passion the Hallelujah Chorus. And they ended with this song. All for Jesus, all for Jesus. All my days and all my hours. It is still reverberating in my heart today. Well, friends, that's a few of the high points of our journey together with the men. I'm grateful for the many men 
God has brought from the darkness to his light. But for now, I must bid you all a fond farewell. So in Chinese, we might say, Zai Jin, or Hang On. In Thai, we could say, Ko Prajau, Song Ui Prapon Tan. Or in Mien, it could be, To Tin Hong Cha Mei Bua Tong Imo. Or as a last resort, we could even use English and say, God be with you till we meet again.